Chris has started. Okay, good afternoon to all of you. We are starting the second two hour session on sustainable engineering. And today's topic is sustainable development and technology, which will also include the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. It's going to be a two hour session covering all these things. Let us see the next slide. We have already discussed in our last session what is sustainable development and the Brundtland statement at the Brundtland definition, which was given by the United Nations for sustainable development. A modified version of that statement I'm just giving here because this session we are going to discuss sustainable development and technology as also our goals, development goals. So just transforming the definition which was given earlier, sustainable development refers to a mode of human development in which resource use aims to meet human needs while ensuring the sustainability of the natural system and environment so that these needs can be met not only in the present but also for generations to come. So our concern is the generations to come, not the present population. Obviously, we expect that the generations to come will be much more in numbers compared to us. You know, in the Hindu mythology, there are 33 crores of gods. It has come from a concept that at that time, the, the scriptures were written, the Veda, the Dihasa, the Arinevas, these were written. They expected that around 33 crores people would have died and gone to the heaven. So all those who have gone to the heaven, they counted as a god or goddess. That's why this 33 crores of gods or goddess have come. But right now, it will not be 33 crores. It will be hundreds of crores. Of course, nobody has got an exact count. So the number of gods have to be changed based on this definition. See the next one. Why is sustainable development important? In the last session itself, I have told that sustainable development is a, it's a matter of survival so that we need not be an extinct species. You know, thousands of species on this earth have become extinct. Their data is available. Also, there are some species on the verge of extinction. Those species are given in a book called the Red Data Book. So a Red Data Book is nothing but a book having the list of species of extinct, list of species which are going to be extinct soon. The most powerful species in the on this earth was supposed to be the dinosaurs. I think you would have seen that film which depicts the re revival of dinosaurs into the new world. They survived in millions of years back, around 30 to 16 millions of years back. And only reminiscences are now available, only their fossils are now available. Now, dinosaur is not available anywhere on the earth. The film which I've seen is only an imaginary story. Maybe their miniature forms are available, the lizards. The lizards, the house lizards which we see are maybe the minor or miniature forms of uh, dinosaurs. So uh, the extinction of dinosaur is said to be of two reasons. One reason is that <coughs> they fought among themselves. Dinosaurs fought with dinosaurs and they killed themselves, their species. That is one theory. Another theory which says that the dinosaurs have eaten up all the resources on this planet and they got extinct by starvation, which is true, I'm not sure. But in the case of mankind, the first one may be a reality. We fight among ourselves and we may get extinct. Second one, we're dying out of food. Scarcity of food is very irrelevant now because we have got technology by which we can make resources for the entire living population. But the first one is still possible because on a single press of a button, which is cut by the President of the United States of America, 
The entire earth can be burned five times. That key is under the control of the U.S. president, and many other countries are also having weapons very, very much near to it. Maybe not to burn five times the earth. And just remember, if a madman takes over the, as the American president, what can happen? So the earth is always at peril, at risk. But protecting the resource and the technology for making the resource is a requirement of sustainability, and provide basic human needs. The majority of the population are not in search of luxury. Luxury is affordable to only very less percentage of population. Population at large needs the basic human needs, food, shelter, and clothing, which we call as in Maslow's chart of management. This is called as the basic needs or primary needs. Then, in the primary needs come the agriculture because there was a time when men used to be nomads, we never cultivated, and we ate from the nature. Normally the fruits and fruits were, the fruits and vegetables were our source of uh, food items. There was no scarcity, and you know, there was no deficiency of food materials. But that year, that era is gone. Now we depend on cultivated food. Then another thing is, we have now come over to what is called human settlement in the form of advanced domicile units, which are called cities. Thousands of cities have come across the world, which accommodate one lakh to hundreds of millions of population in some cases. The big cities are there, small cities are there. City like Bombay, which have got 20 million population, and even my own small city at Palakkad has got more than two lakhs population. So cities have grown up like anything. From the nomadic state where we used to live by the riverside, taking water from the river, eating fruits from the uh, fruits and vegetables from the plants and trees, the things have changed. Added to that is climate change, and we have to control it. Last class I have told you what is the difficulty you have. We are not containing the climate change, and then keeping the biodiversity. This earth is full of biotic and abiotic environment. We have got a lot of human organisms, uh, sorry, living organisms. One scientist finally told that if you take one spoonful of soil from below, that will have roughly one lakh living organisms. It's not a fun, it's a true. Billions and billions of organisms are here, there on earth. And it is roughly estimated that there may be around 30 million species. And remember man, the homo sapiens is only one among that species. And this biodiversity has to be sustained for the earth to survive. Earth is not the abiotic environment or the rock and soil which we see. The soil becomes fertile provided the soil is having biological organisms, microorganisms. So keeping that fertility, fertility of the soil is nothing but the microorganisms living on it. And this we have to keep, preserve. Then only we can preserve the earth for the next generation. We are going to preserve its abiotic environment, that means only the rocks and the soil, human beings cannot survive on this earth. Like in the last session, last I have told a story, a, a small story I have told where a, a, an young man is moving around in a suit, searching for counterparts in the near continents. Okay, now come to the next slide. What are the driving forces for economic development? In the pre-modern era, that is before 1950s, we call it as the pre-modern era. In that period, you know, it was labor intensive, manual labor and animal labor. Energy was mostly animal energy. And of course, the, the, uh, the work was performed mostly by human beings and animals. And then from the 50s to 60s, we had what is called the heavy industries. You know, there was a branch of engineering which was heavily in demand in the 40s and 50s. Nowadays, it's uh, not that recognized. That is chemical engineering. The institution of chemical engineers was a well-known body in the 40s and 50s. But now very rare people go and take the membership in that body because the requirement of chemical engineers proportionately have gone down. So heavy industries and chemical industries 
most of the the well known chemical industries in india say for example fertilizer and chemical else travancore fscp was one of the leading industry in india then farmers fertile indian farmers uh, fertilizers i forgot that iff co farmers fertilizer corporation or something like that yes this all came in the 40s and 50s when there was heavy demand for chemicals and heavy industries then 70s to 80s came the light industries that light industry was mostly connected with electronics industry you know the computers production started in the 60s though the computers came up in principle in the less 50s 58 and 59 computers production started in 6 after 70s and of course the personal computers became popular in the 80s only and the laptops came and became popular in the 90s and then when we come to the 21st century 2000 onwards it is the knowledge age so knowledge creating industries are more important knowledge creating industries means cyber technology information technology data storage then big data all this have become the knowledge industry and knowledge industry we say smile smile is an abbreviation or acronym used for the knowledge industry s stands for systematization m stands for materials i for information l for life sciences and d e for environment so smile is now the catch word in the 21st century it's an acronym which is very popular now coming to the next slide so these driving forces which i have discussed the last slide they shift the growth from input driven to knowledge driven till the end of the 20th century the uh, materials dependent labor dependent production was very cumulative whereas this century this is the 21st century in the 21st century knowledge driven business is going to help economic growth you are seeing it in your campus if there is some campus interview conducted in your campus out of 20 companies almost 19 will be software based they want knowledge workers so knowledge workers are going to be the order of the day and physical work in due turn will be taken over by yendiran by robots who want to work physically i, I remember a story in uh, which happened this is a real happening in uh, tokyo in the suburbs of tokyo there was an industry working round the clock 24 hours and in the night there were only dim light inside the industry because only robots were working the industry they did not need any light at all but just to make the people show that it is working they used to have some uh, you know, very dim light and after some days the local public complained saying that they are afraid of seeing the industry because at night ghosts or devils are walking inside the industry and ultimately the industry had to switch off the light at night because the the, the uh, robots don't want any light and they didn't want to show off with the light and uh, invite public wrath so they switched off the light and then onwards that industry is working without any light around the clock only if somebody has to enter it maybe they have to enter with a torch or they have to light inside so world is changing and this are the ways in which the world is changing so the major focus is on resilience to face the mounting pressure of trade and liberalization and globalization you know that uh, globalization started by the the term the, the which gorbachev framed perestroika and after that you know all the countries the ussr collapsed after that and uh, the world countries have changed a lot now it's an open business across the world so uh, when manmohan singh was the finance minister of india he started the globalization process and now the present government is fast moving on globalization because now income and expenditure of a country we count in terms of the global income and global uh, expenses and that is why the the economic forces are changing and even the microeconomics and macroeconomics or the keynesian economics or the malthusian economics have given way to the amarthasian economics and like people situation is changing now coming to the next slide 
sustainable growth has to provide for a lot of things why because it's a pictorial explanation of the change of mankind we have only primitive man 1 million years ago primitive man means neanderthal man ramapithecus australopithecus we cannot call them man but they were the primitive versions after that when 1 lakh years came the modern man came that is people like us around 1 lakh years to 2 lakh years is the expected origin of our species in this we are called the homo sapiens and at that time their requirement for energy and you just see what are the ways in which the energy are used the dark blue color is the energy used for food and then the blue color the energy used for cooking and etc etc and the other services like uh, domicile activities for transportation and bullock cart all these things even animal energy can be used in that and the third green one is the energy for industry and agriculture and the last the yellow one is the energy for modern transports now see the graph how the energy requirement has come up from 1 million year years ago it has come up to 350 times increase the energy increase has come to that much and the highest after 1950 because from 1950 onwards the man is not dependent on heavy industry alone the man is dependent on intelligent industry as well now see the next slide this is a major problem now i'm just cautioning the participants so many people are entering and going uh, prabha please note down who are these people entering and going hmm. maybe next time we can block them okay. it is not with any purpose okay sir okay. we don't want people just visit and then go back and okay, it's sir. creating unwanted displays on the screen distraction anybody okay, who sir. goes let them go away you know to back if it is okay. by genuine connectivity problem let them in okay okay sir now this is our problem environmental pollution environmental pollution is a global situation it depends see this is only given as the transportation problem what is the transportation problem you must know that 70% of the population in delhi is caused by industry and 30% sorry 70% by transport in delhi 30% only by industry and domestic activities whereas when it comes to bombay or now it is mumbai 70% of the pollution is by industry and 30% only is by transport and domestic activities see and we have got these two are one of the most polluted cities in the world competing with cities like tokyo which are highly polluted and added to that delhi has got a bitter disadvantage that the smoke which is coming from northeast area like punjab etc in the farming season that adds to the difficulty in delhi so uh, this is a big issue for all of us next one please there are also geopolitical challenges because now it's a time of global connectivity where how connected you are to the world is a concern every country survival is now linked to the import and export or we call it as exim activities e x i m export import activities and every country has now what is called a balance of trade this balance of trade indicates how much extra or surplus you have got from your exports deducting your import cost and you know that uh, india is having high deficit high exim deficit when it comes to oil now we are lucky because in this lockdown period more than 5 months of lockdown has happened one thing is the oil prices have gone down very much first thing second thing is the import of oil india is also an oil producing country but we had to import a lot and we are making a lot out of that import also for example if the oil price price in the global market is 30 we will be selling in india that at 70 that means if 30 rupees we are paying to some arabian country for the oil 40 rupees the government of india and a part of it the state government is making us profit 
that is why for example in most of the gulf countries 1 liter of oil petrol or diesel is cheaper than 1 liter of pure drinking water i have i felt it uh, when you buy a bottle of drinking water you will feel you are paying a bit high whereas i have seen the people they are always filling full tank diesel or petrol because it is comparatively cheaper only drinking water they have to be careful but in india the situation is different let it be there but we have got a lot of global environmental cha- cha- challenges and the changes are also going on because now the covid has brought in a drastic change then their life system which has been existing here is now going to change and then the information technology the it is bringing in another challenge because of the boom of it industry now i am able to address 180 people all over the state otherwise this may not have been possible maybe all over the country i have seen a meeting in which uh, the the nac has arranged a meeting where 45000 people have been attending that online meeting and giving their comments so it's only possible because of information technology and the world regime has collapsed in the 90s you know the ussr collapsed until then we had a two uh, enemy concept in the world though they were not really enemies but we assumed that they are superpowers the the us and the ussr and ussr collapsed it took more than 30 years for russia the biggest country in the ussr to come up itself as a world leader that too they have not come to a cha- situation where they can challenge the us hegemony because us is still in a better position because russia has got still power and then came in the uh, the world un has initiated wto world trade organization and so many multinational companies have been accepted all over the world stock exchanges have been universalized for example a person sitting in uh, palakkad or trivandrum can actively participate in the uh, in the nascom or you know the tokyo stock exchange it has come to that level and so many earth summit every year or every alternate year always there is a summit you have had a lot of summit rio summit then uh, paris summit geneva summit tokyo summit all these summit the summit is meant for discussing important factors by the heads of nations that's called a summit you know, there are around 208 countries in the world out of that only 193 are approved by the united nations so un membership is 193 some other countries are a semi independent state or even quasi independent state and they are not full fledged independent country there are countries like a small island which have got only one man as a country so all this together is only around 208 but the united nations has approved 193 countries they are full fledged countries like india now coming to the uh, next slide we need emerging technology development for what for our survival we can blame each other saying that he polluted this nation polluted that nation polluted but ultimately what we want is the development of the people provision for their basic livelihood factors the primary necessities of the human being and for that we need technology without technology i think i last class i mentioned that in the 18th century people were predicting that a lot of population in the world will die because the malthusian theory proved to be true because the resources were increasing in arithmetic progression and uh, the population was increasing in geometric geometric progression so people predicted even learned people economists scientists predicted that there is going to be very heavy famine and you know scarcity of food items will happen but it didn't happen because by that time the industrialization had started and industrialization was an outcome of development of technology similarly we have to see that sustainable develop, development do take place to emerge so that we can survive and there are three steps in that first thing is identification of a new technology which gives options and solutions and new effects and perspectives for technology push and second one is valuation of the identified technology fields so that we can investigate 
whether there is an innovation in that, whether there is development in that, whether there is an acceptance and market success in that. And what are the obstacles in, you can say hi-fi technology, but it has to really work. For example, when I was a school student and a college student, people used to say that population growth in the world is not a concern because we are going to launch vehicles regularly to the moon so that much of the population from the world will be taken to moon and as the next stage, they will be taken to the Mars and Jupiter. Nothing happened. Some four years back when I mentioned that man has not landed on moon, became a big controversy. I'm a person who still believes that, still believe that man never landed on moon. If at all somebody landed, that never came back. I'm not going to debate that matter here. There are certain things which technology can do. I do basically belong to a branch called structural engineering. In structural engineering, you will study that for launching a satellite, there is a minimal requirement. Without that, you cannot precisely launch a worker. And man has not made that facility on the moon. And at present, there is no facility on the moon for precision launching. So I still believe with my engineering knowledge that anybody who has gone to the moon has not come back. And if at all anybody have come back, they have just orbited around the moon. They have just gone around the moon and they would have returned. That was possible even 51 years back. Even in 1968, this technology was there to go around the moon and come back. But to land on the moon and come back, even today it's not possible. It will be developed, definitely I know. Within some decades, man will develop a technology by which return launching from the moon will be possible by the structural engineering concepts which we have got right now. And we will be able to come back from the moon also. Whether people have landed on moon, I'm not sure. But anybody who landed on moon will not have come so far. I'm so sure, 100% sure. Now come to the next point, transportation of measures for innovation. And elimination of information and knowledge deficits is one part for innovation because some knowledge we get, some information which we get will be half-baked. With half-baked information, that is why I quoted this uh, moon, uh, moon uh, travel which has, which has attracted hundreds of books across. So some information which we get are rather distorted, rather difficult to digest. And some deficits are there here and there. So innovation has to be always there. Say, for example, it is more than one and a half centuries back when trains were, transport facilities by trains were invented. You know that even today, train is a, is a, is a permissible mode of travel. And in many of the Western countries and in, uh, in countries like Japan, it is one of the most speedy mode of transport. Though India couldn't come up to that level, maybe we'll come up to that then adequate framework support has to be there because any innovation has to take root to serve the people. We should have sufficient supporting system. That is what we lack in many countries. Say, for example, uh, in India, we used to have the tallest uh, structure when the Westerners were not even thinking of it. We used to have tall temples. We used to have tall spires. But now we are nowhere. UAE has taken over the first position and so many of the tall structures are in Chicago and New York. US has taken over and India doesn't have a proper supporting system for that, I feel. So innovation has to be supported by and our, our funding in innovation is also very meager. Whereas 8% is the funding in the US for innovation of the U GDP, of the gross domestic product. 8 to 14% is what is spent on innovation in the US. We spend hardly between 0.6 to 1.2%. So where we stand, that is a deficit in our country. So it is it is required for sustainable development and any innovation need not be sustainable also. Some innovation, say for example, atom bomb is an innovation. Atomic energy is also an innovation. Atomic energy is a sustainable innovation because we can, we can control that much burning of the fuel. But atom bomb, can you say it's a, it's a sustainable innovation? No, it's a destructive innovation. The first use itself, you know, more than 2 lakhs people have been burnt alive at a temperature of 1,500 degrees centigrade in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Can you imagine 1,500 degrees centigrade? The fire on your kitchen stove will be 400 to 500 degrees centigrade only. 
So compare. So some of the innovations can be dangerous. Please see the next uh, slide. Then innovations have to have a direct value addition. Otherwise, it's not not much use. Value addition in the sense means it should be positive value addition. As we used to always say, a knife is a good weapon. In the hands of a doctor, it is a life saver. In the hands of a butcher, it's a killing uh, equipment. So it's not the fault with the equipment; it's the way it is being used. And you should increase our knowledge. The values and knowledge should be increased. And you should create more working places. Otherwise, that innovation, if if any innovation cannot provide for the survival of the humanity and workforce, then what is its use? And it should result in manufacturing of marketable goods. Marketable goods means goods the people need. Products the people need, not for namesake, and then it should imp it should have improvements for better life. It should have achievements towards healthier society. Say, for example, now many people say the COVID has spread because of some unknown bacteria hither to unknown virus hither to, which is a coronavirus. But I have seen some journals that coronavirus in some different form was existent even in the 1980s. Coronavirus was there, but not this COVID A, COVID B, which are spreading right now. Corona was there, but now many people are saying that this virus is a part of, you know, biomedical war. Biological war is supposed to be a very common thing. So this is a part of a biological war, a war where certain species of human beings should be attacked more than the remaining species. I don't know whether it is true. It is being told that this uh, virus will attack. The osteoid species more, compared you know the human beings are normally three species, osteoid, mongoloid, and negritoid. I have also been wondering why compared to U.S. the death rate in India is very less. No, U.S. almost all the people are mostly osteoid species. India we have got a combination of osteoid and mongoloid, mongoloid alone, and osteoid and negritoid. So some studies I have heard. Recently, that the dirtiness index or the dirtiness resistance of Indians are in general higher than the Westerners because of this combination of genetical aspects. Maybe I am not sure. That is why one or two articles I have read recently that this virus is mostly focusing on the osteoid species and less on mongoloid species and negritoid species. I was also so thinking like that. Otherwise. The highest impact would have been on Africa. Africa is mostly negritoid species, but if you compare to the Western countries, the impact on the negritoid species is less. So, healthier society achievement means not introducing health hazards to the society. We cannot blame at this stage whether some country purposefully let out this virus. I am not sure. We cannot blame anybody right now, but the time will reveal all these things because. All the conspiracies. There are there is a wide range of studies going on in the world on conspiracy theories. So this also will be revealed one day whether this virus was revealed by someone or whether this virus was originated naturally. Virus can originate anywhere because if any good combination comes, because virus is not a fully living organism. It's only half living organism. It's either a DNA or an RNA. And should get its counterpart to become a living organism. So we cannot predict this moment how it has happened. It can it can generate even in the higher atmosphere, where high temperature by high temperature and electric current by lightning is there. New virus can form. It can also originate in antiseptic condition where there is no air. So we cannot judge right now how it is going on. Anyway, I was just saying that all the innovations have to be for a healthier society, for making people avail good food, uh, sufficient food, and for Renewable energy, energy is a big concern. I'll be discussing about that a bit later. This should be the uh, the uh, targets for sustainable development. Now, coming to the next slide. What are our top ten problems for next fifty years? Just imagine today there is no power. There is no electricity. If I charge my lap yesterday, maybe I could have been able to present. If you charge your mobile 
and lab yesterday and kept without using it maybe you also will be able to attend for two hours this session see energy has become a part and parcel of our life and we cannot live without energy i remember a story you would have heard about thomas alva edison edison was a semi deaf person who didn't get school education but who made the record in inventions he was the biggest innovator and inventor in the world got more than 99 patents you are seeing the light now you are having the fan now and you are having most of the equipments now because the general electric company which was started by edison did all these things and edison when he died on his birth centenary the american government wanted to pay tribute to edison a senator told that we will switch off the power for one day one day power cut and we will pay gratitude to edison and then the others were saying that one day is impossible in the us so we can reduce to one hour so that one hour discussion came to 10 minutes came to one minute at the end they decided that in the us even if the power is cut for one minute thousands of patients in the hospitals and thousands of face applications will be blocked and we will have to give a, a lot of demerage for that and so we decide that we are not going to cut the power for even one second and that is the greatest tribute we can give to tom mosal bedson this is history and that is the role of energy right now you and me knowingly or unknowingly we have become slaves to energy so production of sustainable energy is a big concern then comes water then comes food environment terrorism and war disease education democracy all these have become and of course the last one the the bulging population which i have already discussed in the last class all these are going to be concerns for the last for the next 50 years or half a century please see the next slide we need environmental technologies what do you mean by environmental technologies technology and environment are different technology is an application of engineering which we develop in the form of theories and equipments and production units and the environment is what we see around us where we live in where we live. so environmental technologies are basically technologies which are required for our survival without clashing with the interest of this nature so they are required in water supply in sewerage in waste disposal and all such priorities and then sanitary services electric generation chemical production petroleum refining steel in all these industries up to what extent we can have environmental technologies or sustainable technologies that is one concern for us next one please then so many new technologies have come up the latest among them is what is called nano technology nano technology so many things are there i'm just giving a, a, a light introduction to say for example nano technology is used for heavy metal detection gold nano particles capped with kytosan kytosan is a chemical kytosan chemical is made from the shell of the shrimp in kerala of course uh, one of my former uh, Uh, one of our friend dr shivashankar pillai from uh, uh, thrissur government engineering college he has made a new technology for developing kytosan from uh, the shrimp shell so many other technologies of course chemical technology also is available I'm just saying that so this is one experiment i am not going to in depth about the experiment i also had to use some kytosan compounds long back in a sponsored research it's available in the market in bottle form and of course there is a new technology now where gold nano particle don't be afraid about hearing gold gold is now a sovereign is around 40000 rupees now it has come a bit less but nano particle is pretty cheap nano particle means it is milli micro nano means 1 billionth of a millimeter or 10 raised to minus 9 millimeter it's very small invisible you know most of the wires are invisible but most of the wires are in micrometers not even nanometers most of the wires you know 
even corona virus they say it is it can go up to 300 microns in 0.3 mm but lesser ones are also there but most of the bacteria are above one micron size above one micron that's why this uh, you know filters which we use for drinking water they are mostly one micron opening filter one micron so its disadvantage is one micron cannot prevent most of the virus virus are so so small most of the viral organisms are less than 1 micron so i have once seen a demo session of a water filter where its salesman was saying that 99% of the virus will be removed by this filter so immediately i asked him do you know what is the size of a virus he said no sir but my company has told me that 99% virus will be filtered by this it's a lie most of the virus you know the size is less than 1 mm 1 micron so water filters are not effective in viral protection but are effective in bacterial protozoal protection so back uh, viral protection it is very difficult most of even heating boiling may not prevent uh, you know viral infection that you have to be careful virus and nowadays the viral causing diseases are more dangerous to handle say for example covid is a viral disease aids is a viral disease cancer some forms of cancer is viral some are genetic or some reasons are even not found so most of the dangerous diseases nowadays are viral diseases and you know virus cannot be prevented by filters and uh, of course now we are advised to keep mask for preventing corona virus because corona virus is bigger in size the corona virus was less than 1 micron none of this mask would have prevented it okay now coming to the next slide there is another technology this is also a nano material technology i'm just introducing the technology those who are interested can go more into it say for example metal nano particles metal nano particles may be mostly gold silver silver is very effectively used as a nano particle there are reasons for it i'm not going to its theory attached with polymer nano particles or in micro fluidic stage polymer may not be it's the matrix basically so it need not be even uh, solid the metal nano particles are mostly solid except mercury all metal nano particles are solid mercury you know it's a liquid metal and then polymers can be mostly in liquid form or in micro fluid stage micro fluid means its particles are in micro or nano condition they combine together gives a metal nano particle capped with polymer and this polymer is this capped polymer is used for heavy metal detection in certain industries where heavy metal you know most of the heavy metals are heaviest poison say for example the heaviest metal is mercury you must be knowing it's highly polluting very you know it is highly poison also so the tolerance level of mercury in human beings and other organisms are very less okay now next slide please this is another technology where some places we need a big surface area for a material say for example we want to make sponge we want to make water filter there we want very soft material you know that the polyurethane foam you have seen polyurethane foam polyurethane air entrain this polyurethane foam it is very lightweight and having lot of surface area such materials are required for uh, mostly for filtration purpose then for uh, you know uh, protection purposes then for preventing conduction of electricity then for, for uh, you know uh, keeping the temperature they are very good insulators for example nowadays we use nano insulators for a uh, big dark scale refrigeration of things would have I, i don't know whether you have seen large refrigeration houses which are silos or uh, bunkers where uh, sub zero temperature we have to keep materials for even food materials we keep there for longevity for Uh, seasonal use there we need a lot of you know covering materials i have gone to some places to see these things mostly these are very common in places like hyderabad where you know thick sheets are used around the around the uh, refrigerating houses for temperature control there these materials are used see for example here a metallic sheet combined with uh, another uh, nano particle is formed in the form where the surface area where the surface area increases by almost uh, 90 times it's a new technology 
I think those who are studying nanotechnology will be knowing it further. I'm not going to further. I say there is a technology by which this can be cast and it's available. And some of the Indian industries have now started using nanotechnology. Then next slide, please. Now we are going to the water sites. There is a saying in uh, in general, a person can survive without air for seven minutes. A person can survive without water for seven days and a person can survive without food for seven weeks maybe it's an approximation that means next to air water is the most delicate and important thing for livelihood you cannot survive without water for more than seven days maybe in some cases you may survive up to 10 days if you are very capable but more than that it's almost difficult so water is an indispensable thing for life on earth and also keep in mind that what life first started in water. The present belief system, how life emanated is that when high electric current passed in the atmosphere by lightning and thunder, amino acids, amino acids are basically nitrogen, hydrogen compounds. Amino acids formed in the atmosphere along with the rainwater it came to, through the water and these amino acids converted themselves. So amino acids combined with the carbon, it becomes protein. And these proteins were the first life organism. Protein is still the life organism. In every human being or plant, in the cell, what is full is protein. Or it's, in another word, it is called protoplasm. So protein is the original life originating uh, compound. And this life first started on in water. And then slowly it through the water it came to the land, that is the belief system. So water is still the survival for uh, any organism, not only human beings, any organism cannot survive without water. Very rare microorganisms have got the capacity to absorb water from atmosphere. You know, some plants also have got that capacity. You don't have to pour water for them. They are called hydroponic. Hydroponic means plants which can absorb water from the atmosphere. Atmosphere is having a lot of water, even now. The hottest place, they, we feel that there is no water. No, the hottest place is where the atmosphere is having a high content of water. You know that uh, the, the, uh, the water content in the atmosphere prevents the atmosphere from taking more uh, you know, sweat from your body. And that's why you are feeling more hot. In place. For example, Palakkad is a place where the atmospheric moisture content is very high. That is why in our summer seasons, it is very hot here. But that water, some plants and organisms can take. Say, for example, there was an event in Kerala when red rains were falling. I don't know whether you have heard this incident. Some 10, 20 years back, Kerala, red rains were coming. When the red rains were coming, you know, uh, there was a lot of hue and cry saying that some danger is going to come. Uh, the, the human being, the human species is going to end. It is the wrath of the God, angry gods are coming like that. Casually at that time, uh, myself and wife I did a research on that to see how it happened. And we found from so many, it was not our own idea, we found from so many uh, journals which were not cared till then that uh, red color lichens can form in the atmosphere if conducive environment is there. Red color lichens, lichens, you know, a combination of algae and fungi. And we presented it to the newspapers and we published it. And uh, within two, three days, we heard that the MG University and the Christian University are going to study this process, whether it is fungi or something else. And last year, I saw a newspaper report which says that the universities have come up with a theory that it is fungi only, right? it is, it is uh, lichens only, red color lichens. So this can happen. Anyway, I'm saying that there are so many organisms which can grow absorbing the atmospheric uh, water. Okay, uh, this has happened. Uh, uh, this this process, lichens growth, has happened by eutrophication, which is taking the slight water content from the atmosphere and growing in the presence of nitrogen. That's called eutrophication. It's a process in biology. I think those who have studied environmental engineering or biological sciences must be knowing more about eutrophication. Now, water scarcity is a prominent thing. 
one out of six people in the world don't have good drinking water that is true kerala most of us have got good drinking water last class i mentioned but even in india india is one of the most water scarce countries where drinking water is very scarce and then about 20000 children die every day due to water related diseases and 75% of all the diseases in the developing countries and you see india is the biggest one of the biggest the second biggest developing country so this is a huge concern for us all of us please see the next slide for water filtration now now some new materials have come nano filters i'm not going into the theory a lot of discussion i took this from the naturally a lot of discussion is available on nano filters where nano metals are combined with some form of polyurethane or polymers and filters are made and they are they are better uh, filters and even i know silver nano filters are better for water purification because silver in itself has got a property of water purification uh, that you must be known in this slide please then how nano technology can be used in water i think the students who are now listening to this they can think in that lines how there are some project works can be there for water sterilization water decontamination water desalination uh, how we can use the nano technology even now research are going on i have seen some results in the nets but uh, i have not gone into depth of those theories i think students can go into those theories because at the end of the session there is going to be one question which you have to submit as assignment so there you can search for these theories or these equipments please come to the next one then even visible light photo catalysis is used for water purification simply speaking if you keep water in the open sunlight for 1 hour that itself will purify the water because uv light is coming and it's a very good you know uv light kills most of the virus also that's advantage those who can now walk in the sunlight for some time it is very helpful it's the best medicine most of the virus there are two things which are very effective against virus one is sunlight and another is soap solution even the sanitizers which you use are not up to that level 70% plus sanitizer will immobilize the uh, virus but soap solution will immediately kill the uh, virus similar is the effect with ultraviolet rays so if you are standing in hot sun for some time nowadays i have made it a habit to walk in the hot sun for half an hour that's a very good medicine for your body and moreover it's better for your bones also anyway i am coming to the scope of photo catalysis in environment you know photo catalysis you know making use of you know that uh, the, the uh, catalytic power of in the presence of light photo catalysis means the catalysis in the presence of light say for example food is prepared by all the plants as a as a form of photo catalysis food is prepared in the plant leaves the plant leaves food is prepared in the presence of sunlight absorbing carbon dioxide hydrogen and air by the plant leaves because the plant leaves are porous so the same photo catalysis theory can be used for heavy metal sensors bacteria sensing self cleansing one by one i am not going to the theory these are all available on the internet what i am saying you don't have to even refer textbooks the latest journals now most of the journals are available for reading they are not closing it earlier anybody who publishes a paper used to close it nowadays people have reverse that stand many of the good quality research papers are now available without paying for it that is an advantage at the most you have to register giving your email id that's all okay next slide please now one slide i have showed why the energy need is high because the civilization is growing and the latest energy technology which has come in the field is what is called fuel cell there are two energy technologies for the future one is fuel cell and one is solar energy and this shortage of energy you know so far we were using only fossil fuels mostly the oil all the oil like kerosene uh, the diesel the petrol the aviation fuel all these things are fossil fuels basically 
even the gas lpg lng all these are basically fossil fuel related lng is directly from the nature lpg is a cracked gas it is again made from fossil fuels that means we have been solely dependent on fossil fuels but in the years to come we will be dependent on two forms of energy one is fuel cell and the other is solar energy next slide please so all these energy technologies whether it is fuel cell or solar fuel cell and solar energy i'll discuss on more slides later or even you know energy from biomass biomass and say for example in brazil most of the uh, workers have got two engines one for biofuel and one for non biofuel and of course there is what is called a hybrid engine also there mechanical people will be knowing better what is called a hybrid oil hybrid hybrid engine means it can work on biofuel as well as fossil fuel and the most common biofuel they use is jetrofa oil jetrofa seed oil jetrofa is very common in tamil nadu also jetrofa in tamil nadu they call kadala avanakku kadala avanakku yes okay kerala also it is rarely available but tamil nadu is very good for its growth so that type of engine is commonly used in brazil because uh, they have a lot of uh, biofuel growth there they grow it out so that is also for the future but remember compared to all these things the solar energy is going to be the richest and heaviest i'll tell you what is the reason next slide please uh, energy sources we classify mostly into two categories non conventional or renewable energy Uh, sorry non conventional energy which are renewable and conventional energy which are non renewable non renewable means oil coal natural gas any fossil fuel in general is non renewable because we take it directly from the earth and we finish it off they convert themselves to carbon dioxide and water and energy which we are using renewable energy are non conventional the most important renewable energy are solar and wind and biomass i think in the last class i have told you we at ahilya are surviving by wind energy we have got four big wind mills there each one with a capacity of 2.1 megawatt so totally 8.4 megawatt energy we are producing there 8.4 megawatt we require only around 3 megawatt for our use in the energy and remaining we are giving to the kscb so it is a renewable it's a, it's a you know sustainable energy concept but even then always keep in mind the solar energy is the most abundant in nature it is not dependent on so many other natural factors of course we are starting a construction of 500 megawatt solar sorry 500 kilowatt that is half megawatt solar plant also solar plant is comparatively taking more area compared to the the uh, windmills now on the left side you have seen what is the gap between energy requirement and energy produced you see that up till recently our energy produced was much enough for uh, our requirement now you see the future the graph is splitting into two the lower one is energy produced and the upper one is energy required that means there is going to be what is called energy gap or deficit of energy now see the next slide this is why i told solar is a big deal the entire sunlight which is falling on the earth per year if you are ready to tap it will come to 86000 terawatt which is a terawatt mega yuda hertz mega 1000 mega is giga and 1000 giga is tera or 1 million mega watt is a terawatt so if you are able to cap or if you are able to convert the entire solar energy incident on the earth surface which is on the land area you can get at least 86000 terawatt what we make now out of the entire global consumption of solar energy right now is very much meager because all together we are consuming only 15 terawatt energy all together 15 terawatt solar energy we are consuming right now all countries put together and now see what is the other energy which we use now 
hydro power we have got 7.2 terawatt geothermal we have got this is availability not what we use geothermal we have got 32 terawatts and wind energy 870 terawatt and the global consumption of solar energy is only 15 terawatt right now see is all under utilized that means we have a lot of energy from the natural sources from the renewable sources which we can use further and there is no comparison in the availability and the utility of the solar energy why solar has not been that much used is another issue solar energy needs a converter which we call as a solar cell till recently solar cell was very costly and another thing is solar energy is not available around the clock for example sunlight is required or at least dispersed sunlight is required for solar energy the storing mechanism has to be there and storing the solar energy was one of the biggest costly work for example if you had solar cells in your house you did all the solar cells for 1 lakh rupees more than 1 lakh rupees will be required for storing the energy that means it has been made costly by the storage mechanism but right now it is reducing and the storage mechanism the the battery power storage is becoming cheaper and cheaper maybe in the future we can have it next slide please this i am not going to explain much to be of interest to maybe people who are working in the solar sector you know the photo effect was in, uh, was invented in 1839 by becquerel edmund becquerel not henry becquerel his forefather edmund becquerel and henry becquerel i think you know who invented x rays now but uh, edmund becquerel was earlier and solar cell was made in 1883 by charles fritz and in 1954 we started the commercial use of solar cells and now only 10 years back it has become comparatively cheaper but it is expected that within 10 years the present price of the solar cell and the solar cell storing battery will come down to 50% of what is right now only thing is it may take it may take a decade more so most of the technology which is used in the first generation second generation third generation and now we are having the fourth generation solar cells this given there in that list those who have some specific interest in solar energy can go through it and also remember that uh, solar energy a lot of study was done in uh, in india also uh, of course the biggest airport in the world using solar energy fully is cochin airport it's a, it's an international record in the guinness book so we have got standing proof for our uh, solar production solar energy production and now we are coming up with so many plants at uh, government level as well as in the private sector level uh, a lot of uh, you know discount is also being given to solar that is why the solar time itself was misused in kerala in the last government period because people wanted to use that subsidies being given to solar ultimately it ended up as a political misdoing that is another thing now see the next uh, slide this is a technology quantum dot solar cells truly speaking i am not an expert to explain this technology but you see that a lot of energy can be produced by this technology so i leave it to the electrical and mechanical people in this because at the end there is going to be an assignment where if you somebody wants to study more about quantum dot solar cells i just wanted to introduce a term that's all the quantum dot solar uh, uh, solar cells are a new addition to the solar cells which are supposed to be more effective you compare it with the other solar cells and come up with some suggestions some electrical people can note down that now please next slide hydrogen is one of the most environment friendly fuel it's a very and you know it's one of the best fuel you know the space travel is mostly used hydrogen as the fuel because with less volume you can make more energy only thing is containment mechanism have to be very full proof because you know it is a flammable uh, gas it can catch fire immediately so we use it and uh, of course uh, many times students Uh, used to tell me there is hydrogen in the atmosphere oxygen is the most flammable gas oxygen is in the atmosphere and why the atmosphere is not burning very natural question hydrogen uh, nitrogen is very well in the atmosphere 
hydrogen is in the atmosphere then why the atmosphere free oxygen will burn by itself but then why the atmosphere the air is not burning i'm not telling the answer right now there's somebody come up with a presentation on that why the atmosphere is is not burning oxygen is in available in the atmosphere in free form and oxygen is a gas which can catch fire by itself but then why this i think i asked sometimes back to my students and one or two came up with the answers let us see then hydrogen production is very low cost now earlier the technology was very costly now the separators are cost effective and hydrogen has got a very less boiling point that is another thing though water is having 100 degree hydrogen has got only 64.7 degree and one more thing is it is a very compressible gas you can easily make it liquid form like in your gas cylinder the cooking gas cylinder the gas is in liquid form methane in the cooking gas cylinder is in liquid form that is why it can contain that much otherwise why avogadro's theory it would have expanded 22.22000 million times that gas would have expanded that is why we say if one cooking gas cylinder is bursting that is enough to uh, break the main block of your college so be always careful by the avogadro theory if the liquid in the cooking gas cylinder is expected to burst out and burn the entire block main block of your college can be collapsed it is possible that much that is why many of the terrorists do make use of this principle okay now hydrogen has no sulfur so many advantages it is given and it is easy to save also because hydrogen is not that dangerous in saving like oxygen storing is comparatively you know oxygen we are always advised to store in uh, low temperature but hydrogen doesn't need low temperature like methane it can be stored effectively in the atmospheric temperature so now coming to the next slide these are the energy implications i've been always saying that one of the primary factors is the energy implication global energy demand in the next 10 years will increase by 45% oil price after the covid will go on increasing now it is very low it's the lifetime low now right now because people are not using the worker much but it will increase it will go to us dollar 180 per barrel and greenhouse gas emissions will increase gst will increase by 45% and global average temperature trajectory may go by 6 degrees centigrade the last class i have told that uh, it may increase by 4 degrees centigrade by the end of century but now people have come up with a new projection i don't know but its chances are there the economic losses equivalent to 5 to 10 percent of global gdp compared to the present 3 percent and poor countries will uh, will suffer in excess 10 percent of their gdp for energy and last class i have always told energy is more costly for a poor person not for a rich person so the impact of energy deficiency will be more for poor countries not for rich countries say for example in india the highest foreign reserve deficit we are encountering by oil first thing is we are producing very less oil second thing is we have got a lot of population and it needs a lot of energy and per capita vocal volume also is very high say for in kerala we have got around 30 Uh, 3000 uh, sorry 330 lakhs people and we have got around 150 lakhs worker that means per house worker means two wheeler four wheeler six wheeler everything that means per house for every 2.5 house there is one worker uh, that is it or 2.5 person not house so if in a house there are five people on an average that house owns two workers this is the average in kerala and i cannot Uh, question that uh, practice also because we are all having that practice inbuilt because husband may need one worker wife will need another worker son will need another worker it goes on that the change in you now social system is going like that next uh, slide please this i told is the most modern energy source the fuel cell concept you see that car is running by fuel cell what is fuel cell it is a simple technology you know hydrogen and oxygen can be separately available we can make hydrogen and oxygen in the nature by so many means of course people have been asking me why water cannot be separated to hydrogen and oxygen that is very costly so we use another technique for making hydrogen and oxygen so many are available 
and but hydrogen and oxygen can be easily combined to make water and then a lot of energy that is fusion technology basically hydrogen and oxygen combined to make water vapor and energy that is called fuel cell concept that is done in the fuel cell and it can be done in a small it doesn't need big uh, reactors or engines it can be done in a, because no much danger no atomic action only hydrogen and oxygen the maximum danger is a burst or a fire so it can be easily controlled and it can be see this uh, even an even a simple car cylinder car engine is undergoing every minute so many cycles of fuel burn and burst so we can have this in an engine also that is the advantage of the fuel cell and fuel cell is going to be the energy source of the future and you see that one car is given there which is running on fuel cell and fuel cell and solar cells are going to be future sources of energy maybe by the time the students studying now become working engineers they will see these two only among us see the next slide then there are agricultural technologies for improving these are also needed for sustainable development for example uh, improving the productivity of the soil for conservation of water for crop improvement for reducing water losses for modernizing the farming technology all these things need sustainable technology i'm not going to want and every uh, technology which we are we are good doing now even a simple biomass reactor in a house which can contain all the biomass waste and produce methane gas which can be used for cooking in the kitchen is i have got a colleague who is using this biomass gas only for his cooking at home the sustainable technology is converting the waste into a useful material similarly see the next slide technologies for local development you know any development should reach the people for example technologies which can be used by the farmers technologies which can be used by the fishermen technologies which can be used by the woodcutters technologies which can be used by the carpenters you know the the masons all these people if they can use some form of technology and that should that is sustainable it is only for the development purpose so we should be for, as engineers it is our duty to make such technology viable and usable next one please and the last of these technologies is the emerging technology you know this age is called information age or communication age you know that in, uh, in uh, our epics in our epics and in our upanishads the ages are divided into four as per hindu mythology uh, yuga it is called yuga trita yuga dwapara yuga treta yuga kali yuga four yugas are there this is supposed to be the kali yuga where the god is supposed to incarnate and kill all the evil people with a with a sword i think at that time they had only swords otherwise they would have put some bombs or plastic mechanisms instead of swords and that god with the sword is called khadgi khadgam means sword khadgi is supposed to be the last incarnation having a big sword similarly in uh, in christian philosophies some sects of christians to believe that there is a there is a, another incarnation of christ who is going to come anti christ who will will finish up all the evils maybe it's all belief system uh, maybe there or not but now uh, alvin toffler the biggest uh, thinker of last century has divided the entire human development into four ages he says the first age is primitive age primitive age second age is agrarian age the age of agriculture that is agrarian age the third age is what is called industrial age where industry is flourished and the last age he says is what is called information age or communication age he says that started by the second half of 20th century really it started by 18 1970 now we are in the information age or communication age where computer literacy is literacy network knowledge is connectivity coding experience is survival so we are going through a new age so this technology has also to be sustainable otherwise we cannot survive at our technology you say as i told every every communication technology is dependent on energy 
dependent on uh, equipment which all have to run by energy so no computer engineer and no it technologist or no electronics engineer can forget the electrical engineer so the electrical engineering which has lost its glory in the recent years will definitely come up it has to come up next slide please so we will have a small break and we will have a video to be played on whatever i have discussed so far Can you see the, the video? Are you able to see that? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is coming. Last year, the world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. 17 goals for direct action to fight poverty, promote sustainable development, and protect the Earth and its communities from the harmful effects of climate change. Now the time has come to implement these goals and targets and address our most pressing development challenges. The international community has recognized the crucial role of science, technology and innovation as a driver for effective change. But our success in making a difference will depend on how well we can merge the worlds of science, technology and innovation with the needs of the communities and people on the ground. So we must bring scientists, innovators, technology providers, policy makers and all other stakeholders together to join the discussions at the UN. Create networks between the providers of new technology and their current or future users. Discuss how to stimulate societies into bringing forth new innovative ideas and match technology with specific development goals. By breaking boundaries, discovering new partnerships and nurturing an atmosphere for breakthrough innovations, the possibilities are endless. So that the world can have nutritious food for everyone, a healthy population, cleaner skies, and ultimately empowered communities. So shall I go back to the uh, slides or would you want to discuss anything on this now? Yeah, back to the slides, please. Back to the slides, please. Some sound is coming. I think you have to mute everyone. Please see where the sound is coming from. Okay. Now we are passing to the fourth chapter. Three chapters are or the fourth lecture, I can say. The fourth lecture is on Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. This is specifically uh, 
important for students because these are two areas which are being focused on the examinations always, even if the examination is internal. These are called as MDGs and SDGs, Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. These are goals which are targeted to be achieved. Millennium Development Goals have been for a period from 2000 to 2015. It's over, that period is over. Now, sustainable development goals are for a period between 2015 to 2030. That means they are 15 years goals, which have to be achieved by the society, decided by the United Nations. For example, just now you have seen a video. That video was given by the United Nations, how the sustainable technology should develop. That is why I showed it, though that video was not that impressive. The United Nations has just shown some frames in which specifically shows which are the areas where we need sustainable technology in development. Okay, now we are coming to MDGs. In September 2000, 189 countries met in New York. I told earlier that there are 193 countries in the UN. Out of that 189 countries met and made a document which is called Millennium Development Goals. It's a list containing eight goals 18 targets and 48 indicators. So, eight goals are there. Forget about the remaining. There are eight goals. And these are to be achieved by 2015 by the, all the member countries of the UN. Of course, 95% of the member countries that are present were there. But others also, for countries which are not present, they are also obliged to this decision. See the next slide. These are the eight goals, the eight millennium development goals. In short, last class, last day, somebody was asking me about MDG. Then I said, don't worry, I'll be telling you later. These are the MDGs, millennium development goals. Just see it. One by one, you can see. First one, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Goal two, achieve universal primary education. Goal three, promote gender equality. Goal four, reduce child mortality. Goal five, improve maternal health. Goal six, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Goal seven, ensure environment sustainability. Goal eight, develop a global partnership for development. You will see them one by one. Next slide, please. First criteria is to eradicate poverty. We are going to discuss in detail that. See, the countries which are having the richest number of poor people, many people used to tell that the poor people are more in India. No, right now it is not in China. This is a data of 2010, but it has not changed much even now. Change is only 1%. That means even now China is having the largest share of global extreme poor people. But then keep in mind, as a percentage of population, they are below us. Because compared to the Indian population, the Chinese population is higher. Chinese population is around 15 crore plus higher. So compared to Indian population, they are higher. So this ratio is only, this diagram is only showing the number of people, not the percentage of that country. Percentage of people who are poor in that country. So comparatively, you see the number of poor people are more in China, but the percentage of poor people are more in India compared to its population. And remember, within 10 years, India is going to be the number one in this also. India will be the country with the highest number of poor people as well as the highest number of poor people compared to their total population. What do you mean by it? poor man? A person who cannot afford even a single square meal a day is called a poor man. By medical uh, science, if you go, 
if we cannot get food equal and do 2300 kilowatt of energy uh, not kilowatt uh, kilo joules of energy i think yes it's it's in that way it is recognized i exactly forgot the definition person who cannot get that much energy no it is not kilo joules it is kilo calories the count is now only i remember i read it long back that that is described in some indian standard publication as per the indian standards if a person cannot get food enough for 2300 kilo calories of energy per day he is termed as poor and that much energy you can get if you take one square meal a day one full meal can provide around 2500 kilo calories of energy see where we stand and out of all the poor people in the world we have got roughly one third we are rich in that see the next slide now what is the impact of all these things in this 15 years at the end of this 15 years when we look back what we have gained we had 15 years of millennium development goals which ended in 2015 so to 2000 to 2015 what we have gained first gain is from 1999 onwards that is from 2000 onwards our carbon dioxide emission have increased by 50% the world over one gain so it's a negative gain another thing is the protected ecosystems covered 14% of terrestrial and coastal marine areas world by by 2012 that's a positive thing even in kerala the forest area has increased by 4 percentage good of the state area uh, i i mentioned in the last class that uh, we have got a total area of 38863 square kilometers only out of that earlier only around 27% forest area was there but now we have got around 31 plus percentage forest area it's good globally 14% of ecosystems have been developed the next one is 2.3 billion people have gained access to improved source of drinking water but still 70 748 million people still draw their water from unimproved source or contaminated source so we have gained something but not much now see the next slide these are all the gains after mdgs even after 2012 2 billion people obtained access to improved sanitation only only 2 billion still more remaining 1 billion people 1 billion billion means 1000 million or 100 crores 1 million people still resort to orphan defecation that means in a world of around 750 crores of people 100 crores plus people don't have a latrine yet and one third of urban residents in developing regions still live in slums and in the number of people in slums the biggest slum in the world is in mumbai i think it was very popular nowadays haravi haravi is the biggest slum in the world and one third of the urban residents means all over the world the urban residents are 50% right now even in india it is true now earlier in india urban residents were less now it is almost 50% out of them one third that means one sixth of the total world population is living in slums what do you mean by slum some temporary built up temporary housing made of some sheets or thatched roofs or some leaves and all this is called slums in bombay they have got three categories they have Uh, chopra which is the lowest category then then a middle level category of course tiled or sheet one and of course the flat and all they call pakka house so three category they call in, in even in slum areas there they have got but most of the houses in india comes under what is called the chopra that is why in hindi the slum dwellers are called the chopra wala very very makeshift arrangement even a rain can take away their house See the next slide. How much of the targets we met after 2015? We had the Millennium Development Goal from 2000 to 2015. How much we met? 
poverty rates have halved that means poor people in number have reduced to half maybe a good thing these are all paper you know paper tiger never eats uh, uh, the grass i'm i'm just quoting that these are all paper reports i'm still doubtful whether it has improved progress in reducing the number of children out of school has slackened considerably that means more students have are going to school then women are assuming more power in the world's parliaments boosted by quota systems that is true only in countries where quota has been given women representation have gone up for example in uh, in india in the panchayat raj system you know 50% seats have been reserved to women and that is why many of the panchayat presidents are young girls or young women that's a welcome move but it's not implemented in any legislative assembly or even the parliament so it's only a namesake you know what is the what is the power of a panchayat president very less but in the local area they can help the development but this will be true only if in the legislative assembly and parliament also women representation is good but in many countries it that reservation has been given even in islamic countries they are reserving seats now for women then women are assuming more power in the world's parliaments boosted by quota systems despite sustainable progress world is still falling short of mdg child mortality target yes child mortality is still high and child mortality is very high in the african countries in kerala the child mortality is very less compared to north indian states but in african countries it is still high so that couldn't be met see the next slide a lot of things have to be done poverty is to be eradicated even now one seventh of the population one sixth of the population are poor we have to we have to understand that then hiv could be control hiv no we couldn't but why uh, we are not afraid of hiv we are many of us are afraid of corona but most of us are not afraid of hiv because hiv will not manifest in most of the people we go and check for hiv sometimes you may become positive but most of the time we will not know that we are carriers of hiv because much of the population especially the south indian population are resistant to hiv so they will not manifest that is the advantage it's not of much medical aid i think uh, hiv prevention we all haven't taken any any vaccine or anything for that but we are resistant by genetic reason then millions of hectares of forest are lost every year that is happening every year and nowadays adding to the man made forest loss the forest fire in malaysia indonesia australia taking thousands of kilometers of forest away even in the amazon forest forest fire was there last year so it's a you know threat to the natural ecosystem then official development assistance is now its highest united nations unedp is there unep is there then every country is having its own organizations for Uh, promotion of this uh, md is but still so many things are to be done see, see the next slide a small video on where we stand on mdgs just see where is we where we are standing right now on mdgs Here's a question for you. In the last 20 years, has the proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty A doubled, B halved, or C stayed the same? Let's find out. To help us enter the Millennium Development Goals (MDGs), in 2000. All member countries of the United Nations, that's almost the entire world, agreed to eight goals to reduce extreme poverty. In a nutshell, the MDGs are the global promises to the world's poor. Let's take a look at each one and see how we're tracking. Number 1, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. In 1990, 36% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty. In 2010, that proportion was down to 18%. That means we've already halved extreme global poverty. In 1990, 25% of children under 5 years old were underweight. In 
that had reduced to 15.1%. Number two, achieve universal primary education. In 1990, 120 million children couldn't go to primary school. In 2012, that number was 58 million. We're more than halfway along the road to universal primary education. Number three, promote gender equality and empower women. The proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments has gone up from 12.8% in 1990 to 22.1% in 2014. Number four, reduce child mortality. In 1990, 90 kids in a global village of 1,000 children died before they turned five. In 2012, that's down to 48 kids in every 1,000. In some countries, like Malawi and Timor-Leste, under five mortality rates have been slashed by 75%. That's a lot of young lives saved. Number five improve maternal health. The goal here was to reduce the number of mothers dying during pregnancy and childbirth by 75%. In 1990, for every 100,000 babies born, 380 mums died. In 2013, for every 100,000 babies born, only 210 mums died. So this goal hasn't been reached, but the situation is improving. Number six, combat preventable diseases like HIV AIDS and malaria. By working together, the global community has made a lot of ground in the battle against these diseases. For instance, better access to treatment for tuberculosis has saved 22 million lives in the last 20 years. Number seven, ensure environmental sustainability. Since 1990, 2.3 billion people who previously didn't have safe drinking water have gained access to clean water. 89% of the world's population now has clean, safe water to drink. Number eight, develop a global partnership for development. While there's more to be done in all these areas, some great progress has been made. Some countries have made better progress than others. Again, there is spatial inequality. As the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, we're on our way to freeing the world from extreme poverty. So even though time's up on the MDGs, the global community is preparing a new plan to improve human well-being. In 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, will be finalised and the world will continue to address the symptoms and causes of extreme poverty. Now we are going to the last topic of the day, Sustainable Development Goals. And after that, five to eight minutes will be spent on showing the PPTs prepared by the participants as the last item. Because last week we gave some assignment and those who have prepared and posted the WhatsApp group will be checked. And as I have informed earlier, it is compulsory for students and for teachers who want to undergo a certificate course. Participation certificate, it's not compulsory. Okay. Now, uh, let me discuss sustainable development goals. I already told that it is the younger brother of MDG, Millennium Development Goals. MDG was for the period from 2000 to 2015 and sustainable development goals from 2015 to 2030, 15 years both. And earlier there were only eight goals, now the goals are 17. So let us see all the 17 one by one, and that will discuss entirely about SDG. This, it is now currently going on, so we are not in a position to assess its uh, results. This was formed in 
September 25, 2015, where 193 heads of states joined. They all are members of the United Nations General Assembly, and they set up 17 goals known as the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. They have got 169 targets under different core definitions, and the goals are to be achieved by 2030. it's a universal call by all the countries of the nation to bring up to elevate the entire populace of the world so it is not discretionary or discriminative to any country it is for all the people of the world to resort to this now let us see the next slide what are the 17 goals one by one we will see the first goal is end poverty in all its forms the un definition of i have told the indian definition of poverty the person cannot have at least 2300 kilo calories of energy is poor as per the us definition if a person cannot get 1.25 us dollars per day it is poor poverty okay so we have to eradicate that poverty by 2030 next slide then hunger achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture of course hunger and poverty are interrelated so hunger could have been there in the uh, past slide but it is a part of food security because if there is no food security the countries with the lowest food security in the world are african countries india is one of the countries very rich in food security so though the gdp level in india is not that high maybe from the point of richness of the countries we will be in the second half of the list of countries in the world but from the food security point of view we are very rich there was a condition in india when we had to work to foreign countries for our food supplies especially in the 60s and 70s we had to import even uh, cattle food from uh, some of the foreign countries to give the common man here but now those conditions are gone forever india is having sufficient stock now the third one next see ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all at all ages i think this we have failed right now i feel that even the who failed who was very careful this pandemic could have been stopped in a continent itself it may not have spread like that anyway this third one is to ensure that healthy lives are promoted for all ages for the child right from the nascent child to the old man on the death but it has to be promoted so health can be imbibed by better living situations better clothing better food better housing all these things are important and moreover healthy living practices all these have to be there less pollution the total agenda is required for that next slide please the fourth goal is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality of education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all that means people all over the world now you know the national education policy has come up at the center which is in a way promoting entry and exit at any stage that means irrespective of the age of the person the people have to be permitted to study learn learning is a lifelong mechanism learning is not studying learning is a broader term where acquiring knowledge about anything is learning where a study we normally propose for the the early age study where children desire to get some recognition some qualifications etc but un specifies that lifelong learning has to be there for everyone next slide please achieve the gender equality and empower all women and girls i think this we had also in the mdg in a different form gender equality can be ensured only where the women have got equal rights not in words but in practice and this is a pathetic condition that one third of the world is not even having this in one third of the i told that nearly 208 countries are there in the world out of which 93 are already uh, un members and even among them almost one third of the countries don't recognize women as equal beings there are countries with restriction on movement of women 
there are countries where women cannot own properties there are countries where women cannot work but certain tasks they cannot do so it has to be annihilated by a global movement maybe a time will come in the future where world countries will not have trade with such countries have discrimination you know that if we have to import something to us any discrimination they won't permit if a country is having discrimination they won't permit that come country to export things to us if all the countries in the world do impose such conditions such gender discriminations will vanish i think that will be the the feasible way for this next one please ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all i told that more than 100 crores of people don't have water more than 40% of the population in the world do not have good water water scarcity is there so drinking water scarcity is there and quality water scarcity is there and you know portable water should absolute portable water should adhere to certain specifications which are given by the world health organization and only around 60% of the people in the world have access to such specified water next slide please ensure access to affordable reliable sustainable and modern energy for all this i have discussed in detail earlier that we should have sustainable energy without spoiling the nature without spoiling the environment we should have sources for energy naturally it will end up in three things first is sustainable energy generation from solar from uh, biomass these are from wind and such you know uh, alternate energy sources second thing is use energy efficient appliances you know if the waste energy energy wasted in our appliances are recovered by better equipment around 25% energy production can be reduced that is the waste which we are uh, doing right now and third measure is making people aware of it making people be sensitized that wasting energy is a crime that also can help next slide please promote sustain inclusive and sustainable economic growth full of productive employment and decent work for all this is a task for many of the countries right now it has been told that around 100 million people have lost their job in the last 2 3 months it is expected that hundreds of millions will lose their job so i don't know where this is going to end up in the specific pandemic situation but the un was having a vision that about 75 people million people uh, 75 million people between 15 and 24 ages are unemployed and they should be employed but now it is not 75 million it has gone to hundreds and hundreds of millions and i think by the by the uh, end of this lockdown and uh, covid period around 1000 million people in the world will be jobless this is a rough estimate but it can be okay next one please will resilient infrastructure promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization foster innovation that means industrialization should be there and must be there but it should be sustainable it should be without spoiling the nature and without killing the resources we should go for sustainable industrialization which can cohabit with us that is what is required we have to obviously the the blue blue uh, industries which are basically electronic industries are naturally coexistent with the system except for the electronic waste they produce but comparatively they are a better industry for survival mechanism this one please reduce inequality within and among countries of course i don't know whether un will be able to solve it because every country is now working as an individual unit where the survival of their people where the hegemony of their people where the the better living conditions of their people is a concern for every country nowadays india is growing in that line india is having more of a national conscience than international conscience so this the un is advising that we should have an international conscience not national conscience i don't know when it is possible because the fascism the nazism all is some uh, all are parochial in nature which where they want to uphold it 
particular country. Only where the uh, I, I like to uh, recite the words of uh, Rabindranath Tagore in Gitanjali, where the world is not fragmented into narrow domestic walls, into that heaven of freedom, Father, let my country awake. Here now everything is divided by Berlin walls, I think. So where it is not fragmented like that into such a world, let my people arise is what Tagore said in Gidanjali, which got us a Nobel Prize. I don't know when this will happen. Now see the next slide, 11th goal. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Sustainable cities was a theme for World Habitat Day some three, four years back. I still remember I had to give a lecture at Kottayam on sustainable cities on that day. Cities have to be, cities have to be sustainable, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, the world cannot, because now almost half of the world population is city population. And moreover, from the pollution contribution, two-thirds of the pollution is coming from cities, not from, not from uh, village areas. Now the next slide. Ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. So any consumption and production pattern, because no uh, civilization can survive without consumption. And no civilization can survive without production. We could do that only in the, you know, only in the nomadic stage where human beings were homo sapiens started uh, just cultivation. But now we are dependent on production and cultivation. So only thing is whether, say, for example, using a lot of fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, can spoil the fertility of the soil. So, suppose we can uh, gradually change over to bio-fertilizers, the fertility of the soil can be preserved. But remember, even if the fertility of the soil is preserved, uh, organic farming, we are not sure that whether we can, uh, like what Fukuoka has been trying, it's not ensured that we can just uh, have sufficient production. We have got a lot of planting area, land for cultivation, maybe bio uh, places we can use. So there has to be a balance between two. In everything there, we need a balance in growth. Otherwise, it's not difficult. Uh, it's it's difficult for survival. Next, uh, 13th one, please. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Climate change is mostly caused by two aspects, by the, by the global warming, which is caused by carbon dioxide and uh, GHG emissions. Second thing is by the reduction in the forest area, the plant growth. If these two can be controlled by human beings, you know, excess effort is being now put by all the countries to control the carbon dioxide emission. That is why the carbon trade and such things have started. And also to reduce the uh, spoiling, reduce the cutting of woods and to uh, reinstate or, you know, reforesting. Many countries are having afforestation plants where Plants are, uh, for example, in uh, uh, countries like Malaysia, if you have to cut a tree, you should plant another tree and get the permission of the local authority. In India, we used to have such a system. In the earlier days, we used to have a such a system that when we want to cut a tree, you should take the permission of the tree and also cut the tree such that its trunk bottom is kept there so that another tree will grow from that. I still remember in my house, there was an Aini tree, which was uh, a grown-up tree when I was quite a small boy. Then my father cut it for making some furniture, but one foot height above the ground, he kept on the trunk while cutting. Then I asked him why he's keeping that. He said, another Aini tree will come up from here, which you can use in your future. And it happened. After around 40, 30 years, I think, I cut that Aini tree and I made some more furniture for my own purpose. See, even now that Aini tree is there, but I also cut it from the uh, one foot uh, uh, up from the trunk. See, this is what is called a conservative concept. Instead of that, we cut the tree and you know uh, take out its all roots and all. You are spoiling that tree. So similarly, we had a system where before cutting a tree, we used to have the Hindu mythology. We had such a system. We will ask the tree for its permission. They will offer some prayers and another tree they will plant, another sapling they will plant nearby. So that even if this tree is uh, uh, lost, it, it gets perished, the other plant will come up in due course of time. And that's a good practice. So we, we can do such things. 
Now, ne next 14th one. Conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. We have to be aware that the marine resources, the marine organisms are more than the land organisms. So polluting the marine ecosystem, we are endangering the earth. Now in many places of the world, the marine pisciculture, the fishes in the uh, marine sector, they are dying and coming out eating plastics and all. So any plastic you dump on the land ultimately reaches the marine ecosystem. So by dumping uh, non-degradable plastics, we are doing an injustice to the marine system. And the next one. Protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems. We have got a lot of terrestrial ecosystem with us. I'll, I'll quote one example. Uh, some, some 10 or 15 years back, once I was at Kannur to visit some places there. Actually, I went to deliver a session at the Kannur Government College, but some of my old students took me to some nearby places, and I went to the backwaters also. And then uh, seeing me, and some people around me, an old man, not that old, he was elder to me. He came running there and he introduced to me, saying that his name is Pokkudan. Kallan Pokkudan is his call name. His actual name is Pokkudan. Then this, then my alumni standing beside me were saying that he is a well-known environmentalist. He is planting so many shrubs around. You know, a peculiar uh, uh, ecosystem he has created there. Uh, he called it as the Kandalvanam. Uh, that's very famous there. You know, it's a small growing system where the trees, it's not tree actually plant, the mangroves in that plant, uh, plant the system are having two or three feet high, but it's a very good ecosystem. It prevents water waves faster. It is an ecosystem for many prawns and fishes, and it also purifies the water. And he took me in his boat. He has got a small boat, rowing boat, where he himself rows it. He took me around the backwaters and showed all those areas. Kilometers and kilometers area he has cultivated by himself. And later I came to know that uh, uh, he once called me over phone and said that he, he got a state government award for the activities he has done. And he was a, such a nature lover. So it's a it's an individual effort. We can also do miracles provided we have an inclination to do it. See the next slide. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. See, peace among the societies is peace among the world. We are getting divided into castes, creeds, polities, economies. That is a dangerous thing. So integrating them for a global development, global control of pollution. I think the United Nations succeeded up to, an, up to a level, but still only up to a level. Even now, the fight calls and the war cries are still in the world. Anyway, I hope that the world leaders will come up with at least some global movement have come. The Inter-Parliamentary Consultative Committee has come. Let us see we will develop. And the last one in this SDGs, strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the goal partnerships for sustainable development. And of course, every country has to be a partner in it, and we have to uh, promote it. And we are ending this session with uh, one small video I'll show right now. After that, whatever the assignments submitted by all, Together we'll take five, six minutes and and before that one assignment is there. That assignment, anyway, we'll show on the screen after showing this video, you can read that assignment. Anyway, this will be sent to you. The entire PPT along with the assignment will be sent to you. Plus that assignment question will be posted in the WhatsApp group stores. So okay. Now, the last video. The volume is breaking. I don't know what is the problem. The sound is breaking in all videos. I don't understand, sir. But before it was playing well. Okay, okay. You play it anyway. Yes, you play it anyway.
Now please come back to the slide. This is the assignment question. Identify an equipment, existing or imaginary. That means you yourself can imagine an equipment. Need not be existing now, but if you want to study about an existing equipment, you can choose it, which can help in sustainable development. Explain it with the help of photos. If it is an existing one, photos will be available. If you are imagining something, it can be a sketch. With maximum three slides, and post the slides in the WhatsApp group. It will be combined and presented in the next session. If anybody doesn't understand properly, I'm telling again, don't raise any confusion later. You can just take an existing equipment or you can imagine or innovate an equipment yourself, which will be helpful in sustainable development. Not any equipment. It should be a sustainable equipment, which can help in the sustainable development. And explain it with the photos, sketches, and text materials, maximum three slides. That is it. And if anybody cannot understand it, I think they may not be able to do it. But if anybody cannot listen it properly, this assignment also will be there in the PPT. You want you read it once or twice and go through it. And we don't expect people to be below a standard. They have to understand what is being told. Now, next slide, please. I think that is a good photo of mine. That's all. So we will end up with that. And the right side picture, which I which I've shown is as hope for sustainability. This I have taken from some uh, presentation which discussed on the hope for sustainability. Uh, so that is it. Now uh, you will see the PPTs combining your assignments. That will be shown fast. There's nothing to explain. So first I will begin with the students initiatives. It's visible, you can proceed with. Yes, That was by students, now by the teacher's side.
I received, received three more uh, PPTs from the teachers side that we couldn't incorporate in this. It was uh, it was uh, received late after two thirty or two forty. So it is all over. Yes, sir, all done. All the people. It is over. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, now we can switch off the recording. I would like to say something more after that. Okay, sir. Let's okay. Switch off the recording. Yes, sir. Right.